Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Torah class of learning and inspiring and bringing more light into the world. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem will give to us. So let's all give generously so Hashem will give us generously. So I'm going to put a couple of coins in the Sedaka box and I'm going to say a few names for Tehillim. Um, for, we're, we're saying Tehillim for Rachel Bas Chaya Yuta, Chana Yenta Rivka Bas Shindo. Razel Bas Adas, Rafal Chai Mer Ben Simachasha, Yosef Ben Devor Leah, Bela Bas Chai, Chana Leah Sarabat Peshagito. I also do this class weekly in memory of my dear grandmother, Rifka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda. I hope you're proud. We do this in honor of my great uncle who passed away recently, Chaim Dober Ben Betzalel. Um, to save a life is saving the wor a world, and he saved many lives. And may Hashem just give him everything that he needs. Uh, we're also doing this in honor of two, um, some IDF, in honor of the Chayalim, that they should be safe and sound. Yisrael, Chayim ben, Chayat Sivya, Reuven, Chayim ben, Nechama Dina, and Rafal ben, Devoralea, and all, all of our brothers and sisters in Israel should be safe. We're now, we're now going to um, pull up a video of or Michal Vyshetsky and his brother, Michal Vyshetsky and his brother, my dear uncle, um, is going to share his beautiful encounters with a, an interview with Jem. Horai, she it it hatnu, Rabbi Akudem Shnachatam Bipkuda Bir Gorki Rusia, Bimeshak Tkufate Shukton, Ayadut Jagda, Botek Nesiot Nisguru, no Nisharafahad. Mein Tat wird mich so besetzt, ich werde gar in Germanschik und ich habe doch 21 Jahre alt, aber ich habe ja die ganze Stadt zu Jüdischkeit und zu Jüdischkeit. Durch und durch war der Nossi, der Nossi hat der Ort geöffnet, der Weg, es ist ein Weg gegangen nach Klaul, die Säule in dem Derach. Damit der Jem bei Jem steht man in der Tnur von Messias Nefesh. Die Heimtige Sprach, und es geht als Lech. Heim noch mit Pachet mit dir. Bushin <laughs> Ja, 
sagen alle zusammen Lechaim und wünschen nach Chaim und Brocha, wir schauen zu der alle Jeden, was Lefi schau, der Weile gefinden sie sich noch, nach Heere Hamosach, wie das Wert umgerufen. Und wünschen sie, als sie so unser Halten stark, bei Jüdischkeit, wo das Chayeheim, Heerich Jomeheim, das Gufe wird leichter machen, die Gseris, in die Regoi, was sie noch geblieben zu sehen, Gejula, bekor ich Mamos. Nun, wir gewähren in das Kind an den Klopfener, die haben auch 20 Jahre. Ein Tag hat man mit dir gewähren, als gewähren ein Tourist von Amerika, ein Schlich von Rebbe, und er gebracht dem Rebbe ein Picture. Da habe ich eine Mikwe und die Picture gelegt mit dem Tisch. Und jetzt wäre es zu reden, wir haben gegangen, auch auf den Tisch und geguckt auf die Picture. Und nur Tränen haben sie gegossen, gucken dich und jeder eine gefehlt, und der Rebbe guckt auf ihn und mir hat gehabt, ja, wo der Echid ist mit der Rebbe. Das ist das erste Mal, was wir haben gesehen haben. Wir sind gewesen sicher, und nach so viel, es kommt eine Zeit, wir uns einmal reden. Die, die haben sicher gewesen und als Lehrer gewesen, an der Rebischte Rechen, da sie haben sich dort verändert, gesehen, auf jedes Abirui aufzuhalten, Idigkeit und durch dem aufhalten, Nieden. Sie können nicht hinkommen in einem Nord, wo dort die Leichte und sie nicht dort in die Schiene, sie hat Leben, ein jüdisches Leben, in alle Protein. Aber in dieser Kufa, die Leute waren sehr viele Menschen, die in der Kufa waren. Die Kufa waren, die Kufa waren, die Kufa waren, die Kufa waren, die Kufa waren. Já me vem na casa que de dia não vou ver estou isso que nem os neves que bel e chu e tia me pô a lama da tocha lama não é isso? Chama e me imo mochal de cachet petek me joa no rebe o afinishi o já não me imo na cachet a petek como bedo o cigarro dac dac mod o faram é ta bitna und bei Toche Zimmer gefallen, und ich nicht das Petek, und da kam ihm immer ein Schuschum bei den Daim, da er gisch, und auch ihm aufzuhören. Kavor, um ein paar Schwot, ein Chodesch, ein Termin Chodesch, wir gehen mit dem Toche Matofa, und bei Petek hat auf Pegosit. Und Toche Neyash, und er gisch, und dann, und er hat. Хату моя до свидания, дедушка. И та автуха ма фурешет до свидания, литраот, и пиво шуму дальше милим. Сейчас цел шо сафекло, я шлях на юцим. Нах не гану нагад бетес кислев шишим хамеш. בחובדן לטיבס הרבי כבריה אצל הרבי, ביחידש. הרבי בא ושאל אותו, בחיוך, ויתר גיקומא נזיגך. אבל דקומא דגיור, עוד דרבי גסיקט פרמיר וממרודה טיקץ, קומא צום רבון, אף יומתם. ונזי קומא צודקי הספר, דרבי גסטנא פומבימה, und wieder die, die war sein Gewehr und gesehen, hat wieder Seder gewesen, hat er einfach den Hanan mit seinem Taler sieben Wacht von über Kopf und über Auge mit jenes und stark weinen. Und das Ende von dem Morgen, ich habe der Rebbe zu Hasebe geboren, der mit dem Taler ist, hat der Rebbe auf die Steine gehört, und der Kerl geht dann sagt zu Lebo Groner, und gesagt zu Lebo Groner, wo sind die Russische? Auf dem Lampen gestanden, ja, mit meinen Füßen fast, oder was so, und Berge gehen, und der Lebegrunde gewesen zu Rebbe, und sie sind da. 
לימודי הביולוג, איך מיין ושצקי. ‫או תגידו מה שהיה, ‫אמרות, ושצקי, ושצקי, ושצקי. ‫איזו אביך מתמברודר, ‫הרוב הגיע אליך פון בימה, ‫ומאמרות הבן של גיסטנה פון לינקון זית, ‫הוניחה בגיסטנה ומרחת לזית. ‫זה משתבב, לראות אם כולם עומדים. ‫אז התחילו ברוכים. ‫כן, ברוסו הייתי גיוון זיכר, ‫סקום לצייט מאוזי ברב. ‫הוא נדוס את דוזק גאוטון ‫לנידיש קטקת, לפרומקייט, ‫ויסום דיק. ‫אז יכול שתיין באו דקיחו למרבון. ‫אין ספק, אין ספק שאין ספק, ‫שהרבי הביאו אותנו מההתחלה וגם היום. ‫מי שקשור לרבי, הרבי מביא אותו. ‫אין ספק בזה. We're now going to um, pull up the recording of my dear uncle, Reb Michal Vashetsky. We started a Soviet Union series, and tonight with us, I'm so excited, we have uh, my dear uncle uh, from Israel, uh, that lives in Israel now, uh, Michal Vashetsky. He's going to share some stories in the Soviet Union, and I'm going to ask him questions. Um, so, Michal, thank you for being with us tonight. Such an honor and a privilege to have you. Um, you lived Soviet Union, and you lived communist Russia, and you lived through it all. So, are you able to share with us a few stories that happened in the Soviet Union with us, what it was like being a Jew, um, what, is, what it was like getting out of the Soviet Union, Um, what was your connection to the Rebbe? Like, how did you feel? <clears throat> so now my uncle's going to share a couple of words with us. I, I, heard, I recently read a story about your mother. Um, incredible story about how she um, saved your brother from, in school. Um, walking through the cold snow. If you could start with that story, that would be amazing. She had such wisdom. Kaya, do you see me at the top? I do, I see you. All right. So and we'll hear you. Okay, very good. So, uh, if you want to start with this story, the story is, in Russia, we had to go to Scholar, scholar that means to school, and in Russian school, it's practically impossible not to be not Mikhailov Shabbat. So my mother, Allah Sholem, she did everything to save us from Mikhailov and Shabbat, from Hiro Shabbat. So she did all different things. She was to give, used to give presents to the teachers. To, they shouldn't talk about it. You should take all different uh, papers uh, from doctors. The child was sick or put bandage on the hand, the right hand, that you can uh, write. That's me and even we went to school, to school, but at least not to write over there. And every Sabbath was very, very hard. But one of the Shabbosim, what was uh, sometimes before Pesach, was a government test, exam. What a government thing, what uh, the teacher said to my mother, uh, Mrs. Wyszewski, this Shabbos is no monkey business. You must bring your child. That's a government uh, test something, and every one must be. No, there are no excuses. And the test is Shabbos. So there is uh, no excuses. Come the Shabbos, and uh, we're talking now about my younger brother, Shleim Oliver Sholem. He was around 10 years old. <clears throat> And they have to be dressed very nicely for the government test. 
people from the government would come to check. It was in a beautiful white shirt with a uh, red tie, pioneer, and a very nice suit. And it was a little cold also because that still was before the face that wasn't too hot outside. And that was a time when uh, the snow was melting. And when, when snow is melting, there is really others, what is the water and black water even. Even the snow is white, but when it's melting, the water around is black and dirty. So in the time when my mother with my brother Schleimer walked out of the house, my father was at Mendoza was in our house at this time. So my father said to mommy, Asha, think what you could do to save him from Kilo Shabbos. And my mother went with my brother Schleime to school. And we, when they come close to the school, and the front of the school was a very big puddle with snow and the water and black water. And just before he had to go on the steps, my mother was a very strong lady, not short, not tall very, very strong. And she went behind my brother and pushed him into the puddle of water. This was just in front of the school. And he didn't know anything, so he fell down into the water and he couldn't breathe. Water went to his mouth. So she was a very strong lady. She picked him up right away and she did everything. He should come to himself, the water will go out of his mouth. But you could imagine how he looked. He, he was wet, black, and dirty. And she takes him for his hand and going up the steps to the school. In front of the school was staying over the inside, the teachers of the government inspectors and the, the director of the school. And when they walked in and they saw how my brother looked, everybody screamed out, Oi, what happened? So my mother said, Oi, don't ask. He fell down into the water just before the school was very sleepy over there. He slippery and he fell down, but I took him right away. Right away. But he started to scream at my mother, so take him home first. You get sick. Look how we look all together. He can go into class a little with it. And he gets sick. Take him home right away. So my mom said, yes, but how could I take him home? Today is a government test. He must be here. No, no, no. We'll think how to help him. There's another couple of children also could come today. So we make a special test for this couple of children in the middle of the week. And when she came home, she said to my father, I remember the food that was in the house, uh, what she did. So my father asked my mother, so how you think about from where you got the strength to do such a thing to your child? So my mother said, when she came close to the school, in front of her face, she saw her father all of a sudden. Her father was the Schleimer Askin. And she reminded herself when in 1928, the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, he got free from the jail, what we have because of this. Now it be the big Yontif to base Tammuz. So next, that was 1927. But in 1928, the Rebbe already got permission to leave Russia. And that was right after Simchastere. So this Simchastere, uh, everybody knew they not allowed to come to the Rebbe GB was watching him. We just lost you. We can't hear you.
Wait, Michael, you, you can put yourself on mute. You're muted. By mistake, oh, right. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, now I could continue. So the mother said, my mother said, explain as uh, this year when the Rebbe left Russia, it was right at the Shibhastere, and nobody was allowed to come to the Rebbe at the Shibhastere. It was a big danger for the Rebbe. But uh, if my oldest lady, the, the father of Trema Raskin, said to his children, everybody must go to the Rebbe. And later, Shleime, the father of my mother, went from the city of Gorky to Leningrad of Simchastere. And the previous Rebbe is just finished with his with the jail. And Bora Hashem already going out. He stand up at the table and he was talking, screaming, as every eat must go on the street, never mamas, not to let the children be Michal Shabbat. And the Zayde would come home, he went on the table with the house, and it was, and it was showing to the whole family how the Rebbe was on the table with the Sivetere, Sivetere, dancing, and how the Rebbe was screaming, Every eat must go of Mr. Snefes and just not to let the children go in school and give the house up. And that was to set the front of our eyes. So that gave her the strength to do what she did. And that was a little example of our life in Russia. Okay, that's that's incredible. And she really listened to what the previous Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, said, not to desecrate Shabbos, to keep Shabbos holy. And um, it's incredible that she had that insight. And it's almost like your grandfather came to her in a vision. He did come to her in a vision and gave her the insight of what to do. Amazing, amazing story. I read it in Shul, and I'm so happy we're able to hear it from your mouth. Can you tell us what it was like as a little boy in Russia? Like, were you afraid? What was family <clears throat> life for you? So, uh... That was the example with my uh, with my brother. But when I was seven years old, so the law in Russia, every child, boy or girl, in the age of seven, must go in school. And my father wanted to save me from school. And in Russia, is even there so accurate. They they have a listing. Every child has to go to school. But to make sure that the children come in this school, they used to come into the house. So every house was, was children seven years old, like uh, two weeks before school starting, to make sure personally to remind we have to go to school and which school and what is the address to make sure every child go to school. So what my father did, that wasn't, the city where we was then was Chernovitz, Chernovitz. So originally we came to Chernovitz from the city called by the name Gorky. That's Russia, deep, deep Russia. Over there in, in Gorky was my grandmother, the mother of my mother, and also my uncle, Shobar Askin, River Askin. So my father sent me from Chernovitz, a child of seven years to Gorky. That's mean why when the big government people will come to look for me, to explain which school to go, my father would tell them, oh, he's in Gorky now, you go over there to school. And then after the school starting, the plan was they're coming back home and they know already I'm not here, I'm in a different city, and I go over there in school. But the plan didn't work out accurate. And what happened in the, between these couple of weeks when I was in Gorky, my father was arrested to jail. 
because he's a Lubavitcher Hasid. So my father was six years in jail. From the six years, five years, I was in Gorky. I wasn't home with my mother. Because my mother left the house with small children and she was pregnant in the third month. And she had, to, after this, she had twins. So everybody decided I shouldn't come home anymore till my father comes home. And I was in Gorky for five years. So in between the five years, I was already a bar mitzvah. So how you make bar mitzvah? In Gorky, nobody went to show, but that was very big danger. Whoever is room automatically went to the in jail. So I was home, and my uncle, to Beraskin, he used to go with show sometimes once a month, and he was playing like he is not completely normal. So he used to come, that, and that was not a show even. That was a basement with 10, 12 people. That was the show. And in Russia, between 10, 12 people was, was a minion, but that was practically the show. It was from the 10, 12 people <coughs> around 7, 8, what used to say to the government who comes and with the talk, and there was like, like KGB people, but they used to come down. That was not people who used to come down. Those people was come to see actually who coming to show and what they're talking about. But in the day of Bar Mitzvah, that was a Thursday, and my uncle wanted very much I should have an aliyah in the day of my Bar Mitzvah. He took me to this minion, and that was really, really dangerous. But he took me. But I was enough educated to know how to play and how to behave. Even I was in the house, in the house already learning uh, Humes and Gemore, and uh, we had a Malam in the house, and I knew very good everything. But I knew how to play. That's me. When he took me to show, and the Gabbai called me out to the Aliyah, the Recipitator, and he said, No, Misha, I was called Misha in Russia. No, Misha, Davai, let's make a broche. i looking at him, I don't understand what he's talking to me. He said, No, together with me, say, Baruch, Baruch. And I said, uh, 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 Again, I, I didn't understand. Because to me, say Baruch and say something in Chinese should be the same. I, I, I don't know what is this. He said, again, Baruch. I said, well, let's slow it. So he started to tell me, say ba, ba, ro, 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 ro. And then, ato, ah, ah, okay, ato. And that's the way how he helped me to make the broche before starting to lay in the Torah, to reading the Torah, and the Brocham after he finished the reading. Again, with same play, Baba, Ruru, and that's how it was, that was my Bar Mitzvah in Russia. Then in the house, he caught two, three people at Lechayim, but anyhow, that was my Bar Mitzvah. But you don't understand, when I was in Gorky, the five years, I did went to school. Was those were impossible to keep me in the house without school. But again, every Shabbos was a different story. Wow. And how did, what, what excuses you ha did you have not to go to school on Shabbos? Same excuses. Uh, my my uh, uh, aunt, River Askin, the same thing, used to get papers, same, same thing to to build the hand with the appendix. Every Shabbos was a different story. It was very, very hard. Wow. So your bar mitzvah, like you literally played, played it. That's like you, you, it was like a skit. You were playing, you were, you were an actor that day of your bar mitzvah. Exactly. exactly. In, order, in order for you to say the bracha, you pretended like you didn't even know 
what I an olive know was. I didn't even Baruch. I didn't know anything. Wow. That's, that's incredible. A little example of our life in Russia. So, wow. And, and then uh, we, I come home, and uh, then we, in the age of 14 and a half, so Ramendu Kutupas helped me in Chernobyl to find a job. Because what does mean? What does mean help you to find a job in Russia? In Russia, till age 18, and is the law, everyone must go in school. There's not such thing not to go in school. So, but anyhow, uh, my father and the put of us decide enough is enough. Once I was 15 nine years old, what happened happened. I'm not going to school. But anyhow, I have to do something. I have to work. So I meant to put us find me a job and uh, in a basement with some guy, and uh, that's was the continuum of my life. And uh, over there, I did work Shabbos, for sure. But when I was 18 years, 17 years old, <clears throat> I worked already in a, in a very big place, in a big, uh, uh, in a very big place with the big furniture. So again, over there I did work Shabbos, but the government bought us, me, and also my brother in say, and he worked in a different place. The quotas were not working Shabbos, so there was a big writing up in, in the papers. There is two boys in our time not working Shabbos, but that's mean, what that's mean, that's mean, very soon we'll be in jail. That's what that means. So I had to leave the home in the one place, my brother went to a different city, and again, around the four years, I wasn't home anymore till we left Russia. And uh, but I wasn't the scared the different places to hiding myself from KGB not to be in jail. So during this time that you were in hiding, like you the four years, did you have any correspondence with your mother and father on the phone? Did you get to speak to them? Uh, letters, letters. There's, there's there's no phones in our time. That's only to write a letter. Over there in Russia, to have a phone, you have to write in the letter next week. In this and this time, they should be in a some telephone station. And uh, but that's never happened. We used to write letters. That's and how did the letters get to your parents? The letter was in the radio. That's the way there is a. Well, she sent the letter, the letter cutting. But anyway, even in the letter, we would just write, not straight, we would just write in a way that the government should understand what I mean altogether. Wow. So, is, uh, you asked him before uh, what kind of connection with the Rebbe. So, when I was in Tashkent, when I was around 22 years old, so the Tashkent come over uh, tourists from America, and somehow he gave over the picture to some, to somebody of, of, from our friends. Uh, that was happened in a very, very dangerous way. But anyhow, this because he's to come a tourist from America, KGB, he didn't let him go even to street, to, to meet us with our KGB work, working behind him. And even with doing this, he managed to give over a picture to somebody of our friends, a picture, a very, very small picture from the Rebbe. So when we knew already the picture, we have a picture for Rebbe, we never saw the Rebbe. So the picture was in the house of the family Klein. They have a big dining room and and the house, you couldn't see so much from outside. So over there, you, we used to down sometimes Shabbos. So everybody knew there is a picture from the Rebbe. And this is this time we should come to see the picture. And everybody must go in Mikwe before to look at the picture. So we went into the house, and in the middle of the table was an open Tanya. And in the Tanya, 
was the little picture. And everybody was there, and has to solve it. Nobody touched the picture. Only look from outside. We was to, used to go everybody around the table. Only tears was going from our faces to look at the picture. And we felt everybody had the feeling we are now an Yechidus with the Rebbe. That's the way we looked at the Rebbe. And we were sure that's the way the Rebbe looking at us. And that was my first time to be an Yechidus with the Rebbe. Here we come to it. So you, f- you felt the connection even from just the picture of the Rebbe. Like you felt it so right. strong. We had a full connection. Like we are now in the Rebbe's room. Exactly the same way. When I was in the Rebbe's room, I did have more deep feeling like I was going, going around the table and looking at the Rebbe's picture. We felt like we are now in the hidden with the Rebbe's room. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible that the Rebbe was able, like, I mean, what, what a Rebbe is, but that he he was with you in Russia. See, again, I didn't understand. He wasn't there physically, but he was with you in Russia. You felt him. You I felt his that, presence. Uh, that was 100%. <laughs> we was in Russia. We were in America. But we was together very tight. And that gave you strength. So how did you get out of Russia? Like, what was the process of coming to America? Like, uh, where, where did you go to after Russia? Very good. Very good. So, uh... After my father came out from jail, so we start to, to write letters to America, actually to America, uh, we didn't write letters to America directly, that was too dangerous, but in, the, in Israel we had family, so my father wrote letters to family in Israel, in a way, like we were writing to the Rebbe, my dear, uh, my dear uh, Peter, my dear Zayde, but actually meant my Rebbe, but you can't write Rebbe, my dear Zayde, and uh, you are a very big uh, specialist in this and other thing, so we want to have your opinion, what you think, about such you think, and uh, my father was writing the letters, in a way, to understand, we should try to go leave Russia and not to try what we have to do. And the Rebbe used to answer the same way through Israel, through the family, whoever was there. My dear Eniko, uh, 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 my dear, uh, whatever, you know, how we say Eniko. <laughs> my English is so good, I don't know how to express myself. But anyhow, the answer was the same way you used to write, the same way they used to answer, and we understood what they ever want from us. And the family you start to send to us uh, papers. We should go with the papers with DB, we should leave Russia. It took a long time, after one time, another time, till the Rebbe said, now you should give again the papers, that was in 1965. Now, you, but everybody together. Like my father won't actually. He and my mother and the younger brother. It wins. Like I said before, my mother was pregnant when my father was to jail. But now, when my father come out of jail already after a couple of years, we tried to leave Russia. He thought he in the mother and the children together to leave Russia, and then they would start to ask us to let out from Russia, because we was already, I was like 24 years old, and my brother was 25 and a half, such a young people, Russia would not let them go leave Russia. But the rabbi said, everybody together, everybody together should put their names on the papers, on the uh, ask the government to let us out from Russia. And when we come to the government, we just saw this question. It was laughing from us. They made us like we are nobodies. 
are you ashamed of you? You want to live Russia? You want to live communism? You want to go to the cap capitalism? To Israel? How, how could you do such a thing? So we answered the right way to really want to do this, we want to explain to them the right way to live. We want to explain to them how good it was in Russia, how the way they should live. So we are again playing, but they also this is understood. But anyhow, it was a big nest. That was our maples forever. We left Russia. We came to 1966 to, to, to Israel, and since then we have Russia. But that was a real mess, a maples from the river. Okay, and who helped you get out of Russia? Like, was Mendel Futterfoss involved at that time? No, 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 no. There's no help. They want to, that's the what the, the Russians, Mendel Futterfoss himself uh, was like around the, uh, how many years? Around seven years since they left jail. It took him seven years till Russia gave him permission to leave. And nobody, the only, the register, the river, that, that was where our help was. There is not such a thing in Russia to help to pay something under the table or under the table to give, to bribe, that there was such a thing wasn't in Russia with the communists. That was or the led or our case was impossible to give, just impossible. That's what they say. That's what they let us permission to leave Russia. That's was completely unless a manifest from the Rebbe. It was a real miracle because people weren't getting out. A real miracle, exactly. Yes. Do you did did you like know? Okay, a couple of questions. Um, did you know Chaim Beryl Shansky at the time? No, no, no. I didn't know. No. You didn't I know. Didn't. Okay. I, didn't have, I had no idea. I no. I heard a lot about his father in Russia. I heard a lot in Russia, like a big horse. In Russia, you quote, it was called Tauki Kharsanov. Tauki Kharsanov, that was uh, like uh, we, when we say now, when the Putapas or my mother, when my father's name, so Tauki Kharsanov was even more than. Well, so that, that was about Betsala Lashansky, Reb Betsala Lashansky. That was Tauki Lashansky, right? Reb Betsala Lashansky, nobody knew in Tauki Lashansky. In Russia, everybody knew. Talke Harasanov. And that was uh, like a big name, very big name. And, and, and then you married, and then you married his granddaughter. Exactly. And then I married his granddaughter, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> wow, yeah, Baruch Hashem, my mom's sister, who I love so, very much. And if you want, and by the way, well, a story from the previous Rebbe, with the heart of my father, my father not the story, directly from the people was around. Uh, if, when the previous rabbi was in Leningrad and they used to fabrain, the fabrain from rabbi was in his room, in Leningrad. Not in so in his room. And how big was his room? Small room. So I used to come in like 15 people, something like this. And who was the 15 people? The big city old stadium and all the others was in corridors around and uh, waiting when this when the rabbi finished my brain the people who was inside they used to repeat what the rabbi used to talk one of the shabbos my brain yeah, when the people was inside the rabbi's room and the gabbai used to like the room and nobody should be able to go in in the middle of the Rebbe's Fabrinian, Shabbos afternoon, come over, I eat a Jew with a uh, keeper on his, on his uh, uh, head, very small one, and you could see he, he shaved his beard this morning. And this eat, this Jew, come over and he wants to go into the Rebbe's room. The people told him it's impossible. He said, no, 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 you must now go into the room. Now. So, and he was knocking at the door. And when he was knocking at the door, the rabbi stopped 
in middle of their stocking, and he said to the Gabbai to open up the door. He never opened up the door, and this either walked in to the room and went right away behind the Rebbe, and the Rebbe continued to talk. When the Rebbe finished the Sikh, so the Jew, the Eid, started to scream to the Rebbe, Rebbe, whatever you tell me, I promise you to do it. So the Chsidim over there was for sure. As the Rebbe would tell him, Taras Mishpoche, Shabbos, not to work Shabbos, to eat kosher, but the way he looked, you could see he was very far of all of this. And the Rebbe told him one thing. Wherever Chsidim, Fabringen, you should be there. So all the Chsidim was in the room, like a balloon, was the air walked out, went from them. They couldn't believe the Rebbe did then use the opportunity to say, to hit all these important things. But anyhow, in a year from this Shabbos, when people saw this eat, he did Mikai, he did everything. Nobody had to explain to him to do it. All he did is just, he did what they ever told him. For him together, for bringing to be there, and after this, he became a completely different person, and he did everything himself. But Sidim later on asked him why he was so excited to come to the Rebbe to tell him, Rebbe, whatever you said in the time, what happened to you? And he said, and this time, there's a little girl, three years old, and she was very sick. And the doctors in the hospital said, there is nothing to do, we can't help her. So one of the Idun was a Lubavitcher Chosi who knew him, this kid, and you know he was crying day and night, his daughter dying. So this kid told him, listen, I know you don't believe in God, you don't believe in anything. And I actually a little bit afraid to tell, tell you, but because I love you, and please don't tell to no one I talking to you about. In the Grad is a very big study, a big rebbe. And come to him and he will help you. So this he even he didn't believe in anybody, in anything, in nothing. He was a communist himself. But when the, his friend, the Chosid, started to explain to him, come. So when a person is, has no choice and he can help himself, he tried to do everything. So he, told, talk, he took him to the rabbi, and the rabbi told him, don't worry, I promise you, she'll be completely healthy. So what the Rebbe said, he said, but he believed or didn't believe. But he went to the hospital, and in the morning when he came, the doctor said, the child have another hour to live, that's all. And he really inside believed, it must be a miracle. And they went an hour, went two, went three and four and five, till the doctor came in and said, hey, what happened? She feels much better. Now I could tell you, she will live. The crisis, the bad thing what you thought is out. And you know what happened, but she is completely on the way to get healthy. When he heard this, he left the hospital and went to the Rebbe to say to Rebbe, thank you, and say to the Rebbe, Rebbe, whatever you're telling me, I'm yours. And that's the story I had from my father, and he had from the people who was there at the same time. Wow, that's amazing. So here was a man who wasn't practicing, he wasn't religious. He went to Atzadik, no. he went to the Free Dikarebbe, 
He was on the side of the communists. And from what I understand, everyone in the room thought, okay, the Rebbe is going to tell him, you have to keep Shabbos, you have to keep kosher, you have to wear a beard. He didn't say any of that. All he said is you have to go to a bring in, which is a Hasidic gathering. Any opportunity you see Hasidim having a far bring in, you should go. And exactly. I, I look at that as such an important message to us that we should never tell people what to do. We should encourage them to join in for bringings and eventually on their own, they'll decide that they should do the right thing. Do you agree? Very good, excellent. Yes, that's the that's what the story is telling us exactly. Wow, that's amazing! And on his own, he became a Baal Teshuva. Right, and the way now he's saying not to say anything to what to do and how to do. As uh, I heard from the Rebbe personally, once Vafabringen, when the Rebbe said Vafabringen, he heard, he saw. Like some Lubavitch uh, Chosid talked not a from person, not in a nice way. Hey, why you did this? Why you did such a thing? And he like uh, he wasn't talking to to, to the eat, not in a nice, nice, gentle way. So the Rebbe said, "Listen, if a little bit of tar, tar, yeah, how we say tar." Um, like tar uh, cement, like tar from the street. From the roof, no, no. The oh, from the roof. Wall. What? Yeah, tar. No, no. How are you saying? Tar. All right. The, when you fixing the roof, to putting the black thing. That's called tar. I believe so. All right, but that's very sticky. With the spot on your hand, you can't take take this off. Only with, together with you with, with the skin. The only way to take this off if you put some chemicals to wash the hand. So the rabbi said, when this when this chemical black chemical falls on your personal hand, you you just ripping off. No, you're looking what kind of chemical would help to take off this chemical from your hands, not to hurt yourself. That's the way you have to talk to a person who is, in the meantime, not religion. You want to help him. So the way to talk to him, so gentle, in a nice way, the way you would help yourself to take off this black thing, not to hurt us. Wow, that's so beautiful. I love that because to, in today's day, people don't realize they think they can say anything they want to people, um, and it doesn't work. Love right. works, right? I, the the Rabbeim wanted everything to be done with love, through love. Everything is done. I just, I know that when I, like, you you really live the way the Rabbeim say you should, everything's with love. Like, when I see you, we just feel love for each other. There's just, like, a strong right. love. And um, exactly. it's, it's incredible. You're a real chassid. You're a real lamplighter. <laughs> you really... So can you we tell tried. us some more and can you tell us another story? Yeah, I could tell you if you if there, there is more time available. Something with a heart from Simcha Garadetsky. Simcha Garadetsky was talking about the love. I have a couple of stories, but they are long. I tell you a short story when we're talking about the love when the brief. Number one, I want to tell her, Simcha Garadetsky himself was very, very sick when he was in yeshiva, when he was 18 years old, he had very, very bad sickness on his lungs. In Russia, the code are now in English, tuberculosis, tuberculosis, that's called in Russia. I was in English, I have no idea. But that's a very We just need you to unmute again. I'm sorry. Just unmute one more time. By mistake, you muted. 
All right, I'm sorry. So we said that Rabshim Hiradetsky was very sick when he was 18 years old. He had the sickness and the lungs, the called tuberculosis. And most people used to die from this sickness. So, and Rabshim got sick with this sickness. So the Rosh Hashiva, where he was a Rosh Hashiva, said to the Mashpia, what he was, Reb Pagan. The name of the Mashpia was Reb Pagan. And the, the doctor said to Reb Pagan, to, to everybody there, he can't live. He could live maximum two or three months more, maximum. So he must go home. But the yeshiva was far from the house. He was in his son, and the parents was in a different place. You must have the yeshiva go home, because he's dying. There is no solution. So the Rabhachi Pagin, the big Mashpia, said to Rabsimcha Garadetsky, listen, uh, you are now a little bit sick. And the doctor said, you must go home to rest a little bit. When you feel better, you come back to yeshiva. But Rabsim Hagradetsky was a smart boy, and he understood that it's not so. He said to Rabhachi Pagin, I'm not going home. I want to go to the Ingrat to the Rebbe. So he had no choice. He had to take him to the Ingrat to the Rebbe. He, take him, he took him to the Ingrat, and Rabhachi Pagin went first to the Rebbe and explained to the Rebbe what's going on with him. The doctor said he could live only two months, maybe, and he must go home like to die in the house. But he said he won't come to the Rebbe. So the Rebbe heard him, and he said, Reb Pagan, I want him to come in. Because Reb Shimcha was waiting behind the door, in the corridor. So when he walked into the Rebbe, <clears throat> the Rebbe told him, if you promise me to be my soldier, I promise you, you'll be healthy and live long. He screamed out, Rebbe, I'm yours. So Rebbe said, in this case, from now, from now on, from this moment. And the Rebbe told him right away, if such a certain shlichus, I don't want to go in now all the details, otherwise it'll be too long. And you should do whatever I'm telling you, you will be completely healthy. And he started to do what the Rebbe told him, and uh, he came was completely healthy. And from this moment, there was no medicine, nothing, accidents, there was no medicine for this. And uh, he com became completely, completely healthy. Actually, the Shlichus was he should go to places, to different cities where the Rebbe used to send him to see how people live, what they need, how they healthy or not, if they have enough food to eat in their house. And after two, three weeks playing around to come back to the Rebbe and say to the Rebbe what's happening. And each time when you used to come to the Rebbe and to give regard, I said, this house somebody is sick, and this house is no food, and this house is something else, the Rebbe was crying and everyone separately, the tears was going down. The ones, the Rabbanit, the rabbits, said to Simcha, please stop to say to the Rebbe the truth. Because every time when you're walking out from the Rebbe's room, I have to go over to wipe the floor from here step. And once he decides not to say to the Rebbe the truth, and he just said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, yeah, this one is good, this is fine, everything is good. No, Vasad the Rebbe got very serious. Said, Listen, in this room, you must say only the truth. So, this is a, a little story, like um, a miracle. And all the Simcha became healthy, and we see from here the love from the Rebbe to everyone.
So there is a, a lot of things around this story, but I don't know why you have enough time. Wow. So uh, this is the Friedrich Rebbe, right? Friedrich Rebbe, yeah. What's amazing with this story is that what I got from the story is that number one is if you listen to the Rebbe's teachings and you listen to what the Rebbe says, we'll be okay. We'll be all right. Like we'll be healthy inside and out internally, right? Right. That was a miracle. You got you became healthy. But we can learn for ourselves that we should really tap into what the Rebbe tells us, the Rabbeim tell us what to do because it's really for ourselves. And what's amazing is that the, the Rebbe cared about every single Jewish person. He didn't just send him to, he sent him to all different types of Jewish people's homes, right? Yeah. And he and heard I, their I, hardships and he, and he felt their pain. And when someone's in pain, we must feel it. And we must, it's incredible. The Rabbeim, what they did for us, we're so lucky. Right. They were like a caring father. Wow. Exactly. So, Michal, exactly. what do you want to tell the world? What message do you want to tell the world before we go? Mm -hmm. My friends. All I want to see the world, as we should do, try at least to do, what the Rebbe left as a Savoy what to do. And the main thing, what we said before, to be uh, good to all other people, to think for people, and to try how. We, what I didn't do enough to help another Jew. Wow. Thank you, Michal. That's really how all, you live. All the best. We should do always good thing. And then of course uh, Hashem should help and we see it should come very, very soon. That was really the Rebbe was crying all his life for. All Amazing. the best, all the best. Bye bye. All the best. Love you. Bye. 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 Thank you.